This is Georgina Rose, and welcome to the Postmodern Iconoclast, a podcast that helps you destroy and break the false icons and idols of the digital age in search of a more authentic esoteric spirituality. On this podcast, we discuss ideology, esoterica, and everything on the fringes of magic, mysticism, religion, and related topics. Hello, this is Georgina Rose, and welcome to the show. In this episode, we're going to be talking about a variety of topics, all sort of stemming around this idea of hyperreality, which we'll be explaining in a second. But basically, what we're going to be discussing is hyperreality, if social media is truly real, what is real, what is reality. Um, and also, I want to talk a little bit about technology and the sort of techno dystopia I feel like we're barreling towards and how this relates to it and how sort of our realities have merged into this very weird cyber reality and how I think that affects our spirituality and why I in particular truly believe that paganism and mysticism is having its comeback. I think without the current societal conditions relating to these topics there wouldn't be this rise in internet paganism that we've been seeing over the past couple of years. So, but before I get into that little point that I want to make to sort of cap this episode out, I want to talk about what even is this idea of hyperreality, because I'm sure a lot of people who are familiar with my work aren't really aware of it, because it's not really as much, it is esoteric in a lot of ways, but it's more a sort of philosophic concept that people over on the sort of theory side of things, I guess the theory gram community talk a lot more about than over here. So I wanted to have um, Maxwell of Schizotopia, whose show I have been on before. It's a great podcast. Come on to sort of discuss this with me. Um, can you introduce yourself? Um, what? That's your job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, no, I think you did. I think you already did a great job. Yes. I'm Maxwell Cody of Schizotopia podcast also of schizotopia um the meme page even though i'm kind of tired of making memes but yes it's me we're here to talk about hyper reality which believe it or not you're already a part of yeah if you are actually watching this or listening to this right now you are literally engaging in hyper reality in this second so (laughs) i'm gonna ask you this one question i don't like interviews but i want to start with the one question (laughs) what is hyper reality i there's a couple definitions you'll get like with i think with baudrillard it's like um reality that's so intermingled with simulations that you can't tell the difference anymore and that that's what makes it hyper real um i know he talks about like vegas where you know vegas is sort of like a miniaturized world in the middle of a desert and it's all neon and bright and you know instead of traveling the world you can just go to vegas and you can go pose in front of the fake Eiffel Tower and the fake Taj Mahal and the fake whatever else they have, the fake New York, that, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I, For me, what I say, how I usually define hyperreality is I say when the simulation starts to supplant the real thing. Um, that's that's what I would call hyperreality. So, you know, like watching porn in and of itself, I wouldn't say is hyperreality. But if you like... You, you watch so much porn or you get so into porn that you no longer even think about having actual sex anymore. I would call that hyper real. Yeah, and I feel like this concept is what a lot of people are living in, especially those who are involved in these sort of digital communities. I don't even know if community is the right word for them at this point. I definitely felt that way. But I feel like this use of the word community is very literally hyper reality because we're supplanting any sort of real foundations and like rooting in the real world with these digital communities that become our community. Um, So I, from here on out, am going to be calling it the occult subculture, but that's my little tangent. But I feel like on these internet communities, we are engaging with hyper reality to such an extreme that we sometimes forget it's even there. The, the parasocial stuff, yeah, all the para, the whole parasocial relationship stuff. I think that's that's probably the type of hyper reality that your listeners, at least, are probably going to be the most acquainted with. Where you know, I 
know next to nothing about my neighbors. I, I wave to them, um, exchange a few words. I couldn't even tell you their names, right? Um, I sort of know these people, but not really. The people... <laughs> The people who I know the best are my reply guys or the people who DM me memes every day or the the people who I've I've made friends with through the Internet and who, are, you know, we who are now part of a, whatever you want to call it, our, our meme podcast uh, weirdo community. Um, I feel closer to these people than I do. Right. My actual neighbors, my, my, my physical community. And so that would be by the definition I have given, that would be a very good example of hyper reality. Yeah. And I totally relate to that. I've noticed, especially when the sort of quarantine stuff began two years ago, um, I remember I I live in an urban center. So there's a lot of people where I live. It's very crowded. It's very populous, dense. But I've noticed over this period, I've become very, very immersed in this sort of schizo weird meme community, the podcast community, whatever, whatever you want to call it. And it's true that this stuff really does supplant your actual connection to the point where many of these online people that I know, I do consider them to be actual friends of mine. But at that point, it's like, what is a true friendship? But I think it gets especially weird when we start talking about like spirituality type stuff, because when we talk about anything more spiritual, more religious whatever language you like to use, it gets in a very bizarre, weird, nebulous, liminal space where, you know, how, how how would that affect a spiritual community or a spiritual practice in particular compared to just a regular life? I think that in a lot of ways, it could be a bit risky and, and dangerous for someone in that situation. I well, we we talked a little bit about this before, where it's you know, it's 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 the modern technology that's propelling people into the past, um, so to speak, right? Where uh, through the internet, all of history kind of just becomes a, a catalog that you can go through and 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 pick and choose what you want, right? And that's kind of what like hipsters were, um, you know. Uh, I'm a little bit older, so the type of hipsters that I was used to, it was all kind of like this, like <laughs> turn of the century nostalgia. Have the have the funny bar handle mustache and the old style bicycle and that sort of thing. Listen to vinyl records, right? So all this just like um, 20th century pastiche stuff that they were into, um, and to a certain extent, like people who get into the occult or whatever, it's uh, it, it's motivated by to some extent, uh, a similar desire to go back into the past, to resurrect some um, old or lost or discarded form of of knowledge or spirituality and, and to have it be sort of a special, unique thing uh, for you. Oh, absolutely. I think there's a very clear, for me, reason why this happens. I think people in general are kind of dissatisfied with modern life for a a variety of reasons, some more legitimate than others. And coming from very different perspectives, you see a lot of people sort of sharing this dysfaction from radically different perspectives and reasoning, but it seems to be some sort of overlapping trend. And I think this nostalgia is a it's interesting because in a sense it is kind of an escapism in a weird way but when we're talking about these heavy concepts that are spiritual like say getting into paganism or something it it after a point is no longer escapism and it's engaging with something higher because i am you know I, i'm religious i believe it exists and so it, it becomes it, it's interesting i i think it's it's really interesting and i think that The reason why, and we've talked about this a little bit, me and him, uh, before, but I think it's paganism specifically because of this technology, because one of the core ideas in pagan ideology across cultures is that it is a sort of return to nature. But it's strange because we're like trying to return to nature by getting deeper into the internet, which feels a bit... (laughs) contradictory in a funny way and i was thinking a about hyper, this little hyper real was, little hyper real actually yeah it's very hyper real because i was tweeting about how social media is bad for us and i was like there's something kind of funny about this yeah like 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 having the most cottage core tumblr 
where you can't. Though I guess even then, I guess you could say it's a, in that case, the person would like to have an actual cottage. Actually, but maybe I can't say that. Maybe they don't even want the actual cottage. They just want to have the most cottage core tumbler they can possibly create, right? Give it the most naturalistic aesthetic. And then uh, this is a, that's something that always kind of bothers me about the neo-pagan stuff though, is that um, like the whole, I think a lot of it is sort of like they want kind of a Judeo-Christian religion, but they want it with more nature stuff. Um, and that's like, that's what I see a lot in Wicca and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, because, you know, as the world has gotten more rationalized, more technological, all of the kind of naturalistic and kind of magical stuff that was in uh, Judeo-Christianity kind of got stripped away in favor of a much more, you know, rationalized type of religion. Um, when, if you go back, like the pagan worldview wasn't like, it wasn't so much like reverence for nature as much it was as it was like respect for nature you know the cosmos is a scary thing it's not necessarily your friend right like you, the reason why you make a sacrifice to poseidon isn't because you think the ocean is beautiful you make a sacrifice to poseidon so he doesn't get mad and sink your ship oh absolutely there's a lot of that going on in particular the judeo-christian replacing with pagan thing i see a lot i see it coming from actually kind of different groups of people and they do it in different ways. I've noticed in the like new age or eclectic Wicca E spears, you see it in this more subtle way where they like, they're like, okay, we're witches. And they, they even have this like surface level, like anti Christianity. Sometimes they're like, Oh, I'm not like those Christians. I'm a witch. Fear me type thing. And then when you look deeper into what their views are, it sometimes actually really closely parallels Christianity. I notice it a lot when people start talking about this whole ascension thing, especially the lightworkers. They're like, we're going to ascend to 5D. And the language, like, every time I see it, it feels very bizarrely rapture-like to me. I, I, it just, it feels to me like I'm looking at some weirdly kind of permutated version of this rapture oriented Christianity. And then you see it in these, like the other community that I see this replacement with is a lot of it's, it's typically when more masculine people get into paganism and they like, they find one pagan deity they think is cool. And they basically just make that the new Christian God. And then they're just like doing Christianity in like a pagan font. And it's, it's, it's fascinating because there is authentic modern paganism, but so often I do see people simply recreating Christianity. I actually, I saw it another time when I was looking into like the goddess movement, because I'm really into the divine feminine and I'm sort of on connecting to my femininity recently. And that's sort of been something I'm diving into. And I was looking at like the people who call themselves the goddess movement, capital G, capital M goddess movement. And what I noticed is they did this thing where in response to, because they were almost all ex-Protestant Christians, right? Instead of like in response to that, they're like, okay, well, we're going to just make a single goddess and it's going to be entirely feminine. We're going to eradicate everything masculine from it because Christianity wasn't feminine enough. And I was like, that's just doing the same thing. And so all these tendencies I see really frequently and I don't really agree with any of them, but I think you're completely right in that point. I, um, I'm trying to remember because I've been looking at a lot of like, um, what's called intertestamental literature. So like stuff that Jews and Christians were writing after the second temple was destroyed, but before the new Testament was, was um, uh, canonized. And I think it's third Enoch. I, I can't remember if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But anyway, it's one of these, one of these scrolls, <laughs> one of these lost scrolls where um, at the end uh, the, the, the high priest or, or, or um, not the high priest Enoch, um, he transcends reality and he turns into an angel. Um, and that's, that's the end of the, of the scripture. And this was like a pretty popular idea among um, Jews and Christians at the time that you could, uh, you know, you would transcend your physical flesh and, and, and become an angel. And Heaven's Gate, originally, they believed that like the gray aliens um, 
or at least as they imagine them, were like the perfect, like sexless, post-gender, post-earth beings that if you were super pure and super chaste, you would transcend and physically become. Um, obviously, when that didn't happen, they were like, okay, well, it's a spiritual thing and we have to kill ourselves in order to to ascend to this level. But the ascension stuff, yeah, just, just to um, reiterate, the ascension stuff goes back a long ways in Western civilization. And it, it is funny to see this, um, all this uh, New Ager stuff that sounds a little bit, not just Judeo-Christian, but also a little Heaven's Gate. A little heaven's gate and i would say be very careful with that stuff because when you don't get the literal physical transformation that you want that's when people start to say okay if we, we didn't get the apocalypse we wanted we're going to create the apocalypse that we wanted oh yes i think that we should all when the kool-aid comes out it's when the kool-aid comes out yeah i think it's generally good advice to avoid causing an apocalypse you know that makes me think of one specific system that I always found it so odd and it reminds me of that idea like, oh, if we're not going to ascend, we'll make it happen ourselves. Have you ever heard of um, the Shabbateans? The failed messiah. Okay, yeah. But one of their take was, for those who don't know, I talked about them a little bit once, but basically their idea is they're a Jewish heretical sect. They were very kicked out of Judaism that believes, as you guys know, Judaism, they believe that the Messiah hasn't come yet. So the Shabbateans had this great, great idea of, okay, well, if we need the Messiah to come, we need to make life worse first, right? Because the Messiah is not going to come until things are really bad. And so what the Mm -hmm. Shabbateans started doing is they intentionally broke every single rule given to the Jewish people, like on purpose, because they thought this would sort of trigger the Messiah to come and sort of save them from their situation. And that I feel like is one of the most just literal examples of going with, well, things are bad, so I'm going to trigger myself. And if you guys didn't know this, old, it didn't happen. It didn't work. The old <laughs> immunizing the Eshtacon. Um it's it's funny well and there there's your accelerationism back to <laughs> back to your back to our favorite subject um there's a form of accelerationism though if i remember correctly they were super super popular um right up until when i think his name is zevi um he basically i, I think it was the um the shah not the shah the who's the leader of the turks i can't remember I don't remember them off the top of my head. Let's see, was their leader. And they actually did have a lot of people at the time. They garnered like a lot of support. It was only later that they were seen as just a little too out there and then sort of. Well, it, it's, because, it's because their leader was actually put in front of um, whoever the whoever the leader of the Ottoman Empire was. He was he was arrested and the, the head of state was basically like, I'm going to decapitate you and we're going to find out if you're the Messiah or not, or you're going to convert to Islam. And he converted to Islam. And after that, it completely demoralized their movement. Yeah. And now, I mean, there are some current Shabbateans. There are like a whole 10 of them. And they are all on Twitter as all successful movements end with. But <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I, I thought, the, yeah, if I remember correctly, they like they kind of evolved into some other things. But I, like the actual, the original movement, I mean, there's not really any coming back from converting to another religion. No, it kind of kind of crashed and burned. Only the truest of true believers. And I guess if you're hanging on after that, maybe willfully, ignorantly glued to their truth believers sort of held to it. And Mm. some are still around somehow. I I didn't think there were any modern Chabotans until I got on the internet, which the internet is funny because you see these super, super fringe. Like I'm a Thelemite and that's fringe, but I mean like Shabbatanism is significantly more fringe than Thelema. These movements kind of surviving just through the internet. Well, I guess when you're, when your fantasy fails and so instead of it disillusioning you, uh, you, you only harden into a, um, a more aggressive fantasy. I can see that being a little hyper real, you know? In a stranger. I don't think it's the exact same thing by any means, but I think there's some bizarre strange parallel there well i guess the difference is is that uh, mass media today has sort of replaced the imagination for most people 
that I mean that's where they go that's what they use to establish what is real you know through what the what the screen is telling them for better or worse um and in the past you know you had to rely on your community i mean i remember reading once about how you know the way towns would find out about presidential debates is they would send one representative to go and listen to the entire debate um and you know record as much of it as possible and then come back and tell the town okay this is what happened that was their news source that's how they're going to decide who they're going to vote for president feels a lot more folksy and communal than anything we do today right which is now we all watch it live and scream at each other about it on the internet Yeah, I think mass media has a huge part in this. And I think that mass media has really changed spiritual movements because now, I mean, to find out about one of these fringe ideas, it's it's a lot easier. I mean, back in the day, you had to just kind of know a guy, especially with the occult, like getting into occultism now. I mean, now you can just like go on TikTok. I mean, Witch Talk even got it, it a banner on the front of TikTok. But back in the day, you had to like, find the weird bookstore and talk to the guy behind the counter and like hope they tell you someone to talk to and it it, it's really changed like our our nature our sense of community is just not what it was even 10 years ago and i don't know Mm. where it's gonna go in the future i mean perhaps someone could spin this in a good way and say like the growth of technology in a sort of ascending i'm gonna call it ascending not descending (laughs) as ascending into the technological singularity is the ascension but that's the that's the apocalypse we've always wanted that's the one we've we've been all just been waiting for when we could all be merged into the noosphere um i do think one thing with like with the occult it's like well now nothing's a cult right because how do you and this is the other thing. There's a sort of the thing where, like, uh, if you have to define your, if you're defining yourself by possessing secret knowledge, but now pretty much no knowledge is secret anymore, um, and you know anybody could access this knowledge and interpret it how they want to, um, y- you see this phenomenon of like hyper specificity, where it certainly happens in like political corners of the internet, where you'll look at somebody's Twitter and they'll be like. Um, third positionist, Nasball, um, uh, Dem Sock, uh, fully automated, uh, Tradcom or whatever, like some, some weird, like, uh, fascist communist combination or some weird, um, eco libertarian, xeno feminine, you know, whatever you, you can, <laughs> You can put a, imagine any any combination of these things you can imagine. You can find somebody who is advocating all of these things at once. But then I think with people who are like into religion and the occult and stuff, um, it's it's sort of the same thing where someone will be like, "I'm a sacramental Minivaran Gnostic uh, Voodoo Kabbalist or something like that." And you're like, okay, I mean, once you get past three terms, I don't really know what you're talking about anymore. You've you've invented a one man religion essentially. Oh, absolutely. Actually, funnily enough, I was walking down the street and I was wearing this universal hexagram pendant and someone thought, because there's a little rose in the center of it, that it was Mm -hmm. the Lutheran rose. And I made a joke that (laughs) I'm going to become a folk Lutheran because a lot of people on Witch Talk are becoming folk Catholic, which is kind of like a made... So folk Catholicism is a real thing. But Witch Talk has created like a new folk Catholicism where it's like a whole new religion, basically. And so I looked up, I decided to Google folk Lutheran. And apparently this does exist. (laughs) And I was like, it's so specific. And it it, honestly, to me, sometimes when you get into these, these insanely specific labels, because I think labeling yourself has value. I think that these distinctions have some level of meaning. Um, but I think when people get into these like obsessive tiny labels, you see, I've seen it on political accounts, but I've also seen it on occult accounts where they'll be like, I am a perennial folk Lutheran with <laughs> Celtic features and I worship the Pantheon from the Arbitel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, guess like, <laughs> I'm like, that's eclecticism. In my head, I'm like, that's eclecticism, but it, it to me I, sometimes yeah. feels aesthetic. Have you noticed this? Because I feel like sometimes these people, like especially on in these more in the cult spirit, like the witchy spirits, when they're like, "I'm a 
I've seen people call this as like cosmic wishes, and I'm still not entirely sure what that means two years later. But sometimes it does it almost feel like an aesthetic to you? Because I think sometimes it kind of is. That's, but what's the, you know, in terms of being online, what's the difference between aesthetic and, and real? I mean, this might be another another chamber of hyper reality because if if knowledge isn't special anymore, if anybody can go accumulate, um, not you don't have to go to school, you don't have to join a lodge or something to learn about these things. Um, if, if, if knowledge is cheap now, then the only way that you're going to be able to differentiate yourself or to make yourself feel special is to be hyper niche. It's the only way you can assert. I mean, even like I used to be really into punk. And the whole thing about punk is like, there's the people who like the more mainstream punk bands and they're lame, although maybe that's like kind of like what initiates them, right? And then there's the cool people who, you know, like the much more underground punk bands that only cool people could possibly know about. And I think that worked for a long time, but I think the internet ruined that because now all you need is a name and you can just download that whole discography. I remember once, this will feel like a tangent, but I swear it's not. I remember once right after high school, I don't know if collecting vinyl is cool anymore, but this was like 2006, 2007. Everybody was really into collecting vinyl, at least the cool kids were. And (laughs) I was hanging out at some cool kids house and we're all whatever, drinking beer, smoking weed, sitting around this guy's little mini uh, record player and, and listening to this record. It's by a band called Suicide, which is just like a punk band that would have been lost to history, but he had the vinyl. And he starts telling me all about this band and telling me all these facts about it and who it influenced and how the songs are made and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, wow, this guy like really knows his stuff. Um, and then so later I was like, I got to look this up. So I go on Soul Seek and I'm like downloading the album. I'm, like, I'm going to read about it. And I find the Wikipedia page for it. And basically this guy just recited the entire Wikipedia page to me, but he had done it in a way that he was sort of acting like it was (laughs) like he would like, this was just kind of off the cuff, some stuff he knew about this band from back in the day. And unfortunately, I don't even necessarily think he did it on purpose. Um, Well, he probably did. He's probably trying to be cool, but it's, I feel like we're all in wiki consciousness now and we're all insecure about it. And so the way to get around that is to just try to be as hyper niche as possible. Um, And that's when you start ending up with these ridiculous um, configurations that could only possibly make sense to the person who's configuring them. And that's sort of the point. And when you're saying, is it aesthetic? Absolutely. It's like, it's a way to, it's a way, it's a form of, um, conspicuous consumption actually it's a form of jewelry it's a form of saying like look at all of these niche things i know about and define myself with that you probably aren't cool enough to know about yeah i think that's a very good point and i guess the line between aesthetic and real is really vague it makes me think of larping so there's this phenomenon in the occult community and it, it definitely exists in other spheres of the internet too of people who get called LARPers, where essentially they say they are these, like, ascended, gnosis, esoteric, epistemist masters, right? They are the (laughs) the true ubermensch of spirituality, and they have this, this good aesthetic. They call themselves, like, I am fraught or something or another, right? And they have this very strong vibe and they 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 scream off a lot of like random words like oh i know all these synchronicities i have liber 777 memorized um i'm some and they always give themselves a sort of like title but when you actually look into what they're saying what they're saying is not that much right they're using these esoteric words to sort of obfuscate that they don't always know what they're talking about and then sometimes Mm -hmm. you can discover that they aren't even practitioners right they're doing this for another reason. So it becomes, and there's a term for it called uh, spiritual materialism. There's a book about it called uh, cutting through spiritual materialism, I believe is the name Mm -hmm. of the book Um, where it's like essentially this phenomenon. And I think that's kind of what you're tapping into when you're discussing this. Well, not you doing it. The thing that we're discussing is that not not saying you are that. (laughs) This no, is no, not no, of course, course, course. content cop call out. <laughs> finally, finally. <laughs> Let the battle begin. No, um, I no, exactly. And I uh what was I thinking? It's oh no, I completely lost my train of thought. It's um We are talking about like people who are LARPing and become these like... LARPing, LARPing, LARPing. So everybody, yeah, the, the, the term LARPing, you know, live action role play. It's funny because, all right, once again, 
I had no idea what LARPing was until, okay, I got the internet when I was about 14 years old. <laughs> That's when we finally had the internet installed at my house anyway. Before that, it was something that was like difficult to go on. And I remember I was 14 years old, we got the internet installed at my house. And I remember like the one of the first things my friend showed me was E-Bombs World. And E-Bombs World, if you don't know, is just a collection of whatever went viral on the internet over the past week. They just throw it all on E-Bombs World. Um, and one of the first things that got really popular on E-Bombs World was videos of actual LARPers playing their games um, because they were funny to laugh at. <laughs> it was just, it was pure bullying. It was just making fun of these people for having a good time because they like to dress up as Renaissance Fair people and do basically D and D except in the park. Right. Um, and so I remember when that became an insult and then every, it's sort of like clicked in everyone's head at the same time that you could basically call everyone a LARPer. And to an extent that's true, <laughs> to an extent we're all sort of part of a, whatever, a, 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 a mutually agreed upon cultural performance at any given time. I think it's precisely because that's, our society has started to, you know, fragment into all these little microcultures that in a way everyone starts to look more and more like LARPers to each other. Um, because if you're not, you know, if you, if you don't know anything about weird fringe politics and someone starts trying to explain it to you, like if you try to explain theorygram to somebody who's never been on theorygram, you look like that Charlie meme where he's like standing in front of the conspiracy chalkboard like trying to explain it and i'm sure it's the same thing if you're like an occultist or something like that and you try to explain it to somebody who's on the outside of that it's gonna sound like complete nonsense um <laughs> so it's like to 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 an extent we are all larping all the time and we're only the harder we larp the more we look like larpers to each other um that's kind of one thing i i really got into like chaos magic for a while um, that was a lot of fun and interesting to me because their whole thing was LARPing is good. LARPing works. Um, you know, the, the harder you LARP, the more you can shift reality, that kind of thing. Like fake it till you make it, but taken to like a, a, a metaphysical extent. But, you know, they would talk about like Peter Carroll would talk about like meta belief. Like, you know, it, the, the belief works because you believe in it. Um, so just a general belief in beliefs, so no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're LARPing, whether you're doing something from the Kabbalah or you're doing some pagan thing or you're doing whatever um, it, it, it'll work based on how much you believe in it so I don't know LARPing and magical thinking seem to be pretty much the same thing there's a huge overlap and I, I didn't realize that until relatively recently because in the occult community LARPer is used very in a, in a rude way it's like if you see someone whose practice is not what they're representing it as like Oh, they're a LARPer. It's used as as a as a big insult, right? Like if you know someone in your little yeah. occult space, and it turns out that they are not actually as good at Solomonic magic as they claim they are, call them a LARPer. That's that's fighting words. You know what I mean? But the line between LARP and reality is a weird one, and, and this is a story that actually happened to me this past weekend. So I was at, and this this is going to sound like a tangent. I promise this is related. I went to this black church in the city on Sunday, right? And I was there with my boyfriend. We're both really into theology, as I have a channel on this, and, and he's a Catholic who's really into the Catholicism stuff. And in that exact church, there was a girl getting, uh, like, basically converted in. And I recognized her face from the internet. She was this, um, I'm not going to name her for privacy reasons, but she, and she's someone I had seen, she's someone I actually followed on Twitter, who's this, like, e-girl and she i always got the vibe her ideological nicheness was very much a larp thing but she was there and it was like her just with her family you know it was not not some public event i don't even know if those pictures went on social media of her there but mm -hmm. i was like wait i thought this was internet larp but i was like no this girl has actually gone through these steps of converting religions and at that point i mean I don't think that's LARPing anymore. If you've gone from, well, I'm going to be Catholic because it's a cool aesthetic on Instagram, you know, to I am at a Catholic church converting, you know, is that, is that LARP anymore? I don't think I can even call that LARP, you know? I mean, I feel like I now just talk about this all the time, but Larry, the cable guy, Larry, the cable guy, I don't even know his real name, but he is like a, he was a comedian from, I think, New Jersey. You know, he was kind of like a, Yankee, basically. Um, and then his Larry the Cable Guy character was just a character he was doing. 
Um, but now over the years, like he's gotten so into that character that he actually became Larry the Cable Guy. Like I think he actually became a Republican and actually started to become like, you know, um, the, the actual character. And I think Andrew Dice Clay, it's the same thing. Like he was pretending, you know, the, a, 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 Clay was a character he was playing, like Italian tough guy. Um, but now he kind of really acts like that. Um, when you see him in interviews and stuff and I, I don't know how much he knows uh, it's a, it's a character or not. So I, I feel like that's with everything, especially with celebrities where they, they adopt a certain persona, um, in pursuit of fame or success or whatever. And then over time, I think they, you, you inevitably start to become that thing. So that's a real, that's sort of like, and then is it, is it really still LARPing? Okay. The terrifying thing is it might be. Be. it might still be larping um and you just get you just get lost in your own your own larp sauce the social media stuff is really a very interesting example of it because you know i've known a lot of people who are you know meme page admins podcasters all that right and i've noticed this where there are some people who really do try to like essentially put on a persona for the internet and I know a lot of people act like that's some horrible thing, but I think it's it's not the end of the world because it is someone who's doing that to distance their real life from their public life, which mm-hmm. if you ever see how deranged people are on the internet, I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. But regardless, I mean, even if you're someone who is authentically yourself, you're someone who even, people, some people even use their real names, right? People always act differently in public and in private, but I've noticed almost universally a lot of these people on social media even like the reply guy accounts with like 50 followers who just like tweet about you know how much they love crowley right a lot of them follow me they'll be like i love crowley and they're they're not like (laughs) content people they're just like twitter reply guys but inevitably people do kind of merge with their social media self because people act differently in public and in private no matter who they are and so it's weird because they do merge in a very strange way like I, you know, I, I don't do this 24 seven. I have a mundane life outside of this, but sometimes I'm like, is that like, is, is it a persona? I don't, I don't really think it is, but it's, it's strange. And I think now that like social media has changed celebrity culture, they're not celebrities anymore. Like if you are someone, I mean, you can just grab your phone and make an account. And even the reply guys, this kind of happens to, and the reply guys are not, you know, people doing this too seriously. Right. So it's like, where does this line blur are we becoming but if also no. it's like, if you can become some persona was that persona ever actually separate from you you know what i mean like didn't you kind of already have that part of you no. in you? You think so? this is, i mean no okay so for a long time people would ask me they're like i have a i have a good friend who has a, a super successful meme page we both went to college together um I'm not going to say her name, but she 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 has a super successful meme page. And I showed her Schizotopia in the early days, um, like kind of looking for her approval because I'm like, you you like you're really successful at this. Like, what do you what do you how do you think my thing is going? And she said, you have the most stressful meme page I've ever seen. And <laughs> a lot of she's like, this, this is the most stressful account I've ever seen. And I was like, what, what do you mean? And she's like, because it's all just like completely contradicting messages and like weird images and ideologies that you, you've thrown together into a collage. And I'm kind of like, well, yeah, that's what I'm going for. Right. And since then I've had a lot of my like close friends be like, Hey, like, aren't you worried about constantly engaging in this kind of stuff where like people can't tell if it's left wing or right wing, or it's like, pro conspiracy anti-conspiracy like don't you think this might like hurt you over time like not not in terms of like your real life but in terms of like your psyche don't you think this can hurt you and this whole time i've been like no i'm just too tough and too desensitized and too much of a super epic based meme lord to actually be affected by any of this but in like recent months i've kind of been like maybe not maybe it is frying my brain and <laughs> maybe I need to get to do something else because I feel like you can actually catch meme brain as a disease. And this is where it gets kind of freaky. This is where, where I think memes can actually be like a neurolinguistic virus where there's only so many templates going on at once, you know, like nobody thing. Um, this be like 
punchline, you know, top text, bottom text, whatever. Like you, you there's only, uh, it's almost as if what, you know, just all of these like sort of like templates that, that most memes are built around that you can play with um, and you can change and you can subvert, but there you're still always contending with those templates. And there was one point where I was like going to seven <laughs> eleven, and in my head, I was just like Gatorade be like, you know, like, <laughs> You know, I was buying Gatorade and I was like, no, like, fuck, why am I thinking about it like that? Like, that's, I'm just, I have actual meme brain. Now just random objects I I see in my real life start to turn into memes. I'm like, this is fucking unhinged. I can't keep doing this. I don't want to keep doing this. I don't want to have meme brain. This is terrible. And then the other thing is, it's like, even if I'm manipulating the memes, even if I'm, even if I'm putting my own spin on them, like I said, you still have all these like weird little archetypal templates that you didn't come up with. And then it's like, well, who did? Where they they start somewhere and then for whatever reason because they they fall at a certain place in the zeitgeist everybody jumps on them so it's still it's like you know it's a it's it's hive mind and there's something weird and kind of darwinian about it where it's like this just hap- happens to be the most well adapted meme uh, at this pop cultural moment and therefore it you know it, it, it succeeds but the the reasons why it succeeded can be completely irrational um, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to be subject to that. I don't think the human brain is even supposed to be subject to that kind of thing. Uh, I don't, I don't like being an extension of an algorithm. Oh yeah. I've actually had meme brain. I like this term multiple times where I'll be just like going through my mundane life, right? Like I'll be at the corner store getting something and I'll have some thought like that. Actually, recently I was reading about, is this book called The Archetype of Initiation, which is basically about like, it's it's a very union psychology heavy book and it's about the nature of initiations. A friend of mine actually gave me this book because she really liked it. And I was reading through this and I was like, you know, the Wojak memes are kind of like archetypes. And then I like was reading the book and I was reading through these archetypes and I was like, this one's like this meme. This is the NPC. And I was like, stop, stop. I am losing my mind. <laughs> I was like, if this is what mystics talk about when they say that um, mysticism is like dancing with, with psychosis at times where it's you're, you're, you're sort of swimming in the pool when the actual psychotic would drown. And I was like, I was like, I'm losing it. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting because I think there is like a very weirdly, spiritual dimension to the meme thing. I mean, Chaos Magicians have been saying this for a long time, that memetics have an esoteric value to them. And I think the first time I heard that, I was like, that is the cringiest, dumbest thing I've ever heard. I was like, this is like when people started saying they could cast spells using emojis. I don't know if you know this, there was a thing in Tumblr in like 2016 where these like girls would, they would basically line a string of emojis together that has a similar theme and be like, this is my emoji spell. And I was like, nah, this is like emoji spell stuff. I am, I'm a true occultist. I am beyond this. The memes, <laughs> the memes are not esoteric. Real esotericism is when you, you read Crowley a million times. But and would, I was wouldn't like, it be the magic you think you're immune to that you're the most susceptible to? Oh, absolutely. And then I was like, no, I mean, memetics, the chaos, which is all right. There is a spiritual dimension to them. And I think there's something weird because they kind of are sort of taking on this they, they are taking on the form of, like, a union archetype. So when we look at the archetypes of, like, he named, they are positions in society that existed at the time, right? And so I think these memes are, like, taking on this archetypal thing. But if that's true, that's kind of terrifying because that means that the memes are actually penetrating the collective unconscious, which, if so, means that the algorithm is actively affecting the collective unconscious, which, when you're engaging with certain mm-hmm. forms of their spirituality, you are actively pulling from which means the algorithm is no longer something programmed by computer people, but is something of a more spiritual level, which in that case makes me want to scream into a paper bag. (laughs) You see, I'm doing the thing you said earlier where I'm like in the, the, what, what is it the show it's from i think it's it's always sunny where it's the guy with the board yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's pepe sylvia it's pepe sylvia that's me right now actually And then, so then the, the, the conflict I always have is it's like, okay, is the algorithm pushing down on us and it's making us crazy? Or is the algorithm truly actually just a neutral mirror of what we really are and we just don't like it? <laughs> and so we want to blame, we want to blame other people. Cause it's the other thing where it's like, people love to hate on Zuckerberg and Twitter and Elon Musk, whatever. And obviously I think 
to a large extent it is deserved but i also can't help but feel like a lot of it is projection where it's like you willingly waste your time (laughs) so much of your time on instagram and twitter and social media and then and then you turn around uh and you know you 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 hate zuckerberg you hate these other people um because in a way they represent time that you willingly gave up it reminds me of that really old, like, I think it was a Jaden Smith tweet where it was, cyberbullying isn't real, just close your eyes. And it kind of, kind of <laughs> reminds Tyler, me. That was Tyler, the creator. Was it? Oh, okay. I, I, know. Can't, I, don't I can't let you attribute that to Jaden Smith. <laughs> oh, I apologize. I'll, I'll, I'll issue a, I'll, I'll issue like a whole ass, like, Twitter notes app apology over this, this horrific uh, attribution. That's well, pretty yeah, good. Like, That's gonna be a meme, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My inability to cite people. But yeah. No, specifically like just taking Tyler the creator quotes and just attributing <laughs> to Smith. I think we should make this a thing. I think we need to to give this to the algorithm. But yeah, I mean, there's this thing actually where people, this was probably I don't know, about a year ago, where these people were trying to, like, do algorithm magic, and they would actually get, like, seven-day candles like you would for a saint or a deity, and, like, write Instagram on them, and they were doing magic to the algorithm and leaving offerings to the algorithm and, like, trying to make, like, sigils to represent the algorithm. And so these, like, internet witches were essentially working with the algorithm like a god. And at the time, I was like, that's, I I don't know. And so I actually tried it actually gave offerings to the nebulous concept of the algorithm and my numbers actually Whoa. went up that week and i remember Whoa. sitting there and being like what does this mean i was like what are the metaphysical consequences of what i have just done um yeah i mean i've always loved the idea that like we turn on the ai and it just immediately starts doing like telekinesis <laughs> it, starts, it starts being like actually actually magic is real um <laughs> it, start, it starts just it just instantly becomes a wizard um i like that idea a lot i think it'd be a funny end of history um but gee i i guess i mean if you if you think that if a machine is ultimately matter and magic would just be mind or spirit over matter, why would why would any machine be not subject to um, to some kind of magical will? No, I mean, it would be. I mean, if this is the thing, when I thought about it, I was like, if you follow a lot of theological conclusions in esotericism, it makes sense. Like, one of the key ideas that I've talked about a lot is the microcosm and the macrocosm, which is essentially the idea of as above, so below. What happens in the little mm-hmm. space affects the big space. Is the internet not just another microcosm? Which then, if you think about it, if your mind, like if you're someone who's on social media, you're putting a lot of your mind into social media, like let's say the TikTok for you page, because that's the most customized algorithmic platform because no one really searches on TikTok. They just are given what to consume, right? Mm-hmm. When you put in the views, because it even tracks how long you look at something, is that not just a macrocosm of what's going on into your mind reflected back to you? Which in that case, that means that the internet would actually be a pretty potent tool for shadow work or introspection based on what the algorithm decides to throw at you, which I think would be a very interesting psychological exercise, I guess. Yeah, I like the idea of the I like the idea of the the algorithm just being a mirror of you. And that would that, that's like that's ideally what it would be, except we know that the algorithm gets manipulated to sell you things, right? Um, what's funny is I've kind of broken my algorithm. I've looked up so much weird stuff that I get so many disparate advertisements that I feel like the algorithm just it doesn't know what to do with me anymore. Cuz now I will get advertisements for cars, um then i'll get an advertisement for like do you want to convert to islam then i'll get an advertisement for do you want to be a lutheran Uh, then i'll get an advertisement for do you want to be a mormon then i'll get an advertisement for um like uh, i'll sometimes i'll get like spanish language advertisements you know i'm just like i feel like i've I've looked at so many different things now (laughs) that I've, i've i've somehow broken my algorithm I think it's possible to break it because I've noticed people who subscribe to my YouTube channel, they get Mormon ads on my YouTube channel all the time. They're one of my top advertisers, actually. The Church of Mormon, the the Church of Latter-day Saints. It's like my top advertiser. Just from talking about Joseph Smith being a wizard? 
Yeah, it's because I've made like Twitter jokes about Joseph Smith being a, a polyamorous crystal girl wizard. And I guess the <laughs> Trick of Latter-day Saints was like, yeah, let's run some ads on this girl's content. It's, it's, uh, it's so weird. And, and I at one point made this joke that uh, the tech company owners are demiurges. And I, I said that as just a joke. Yeah. And then I no. had this like, weird existential crisis where I was sitting in my apartment on my bed and I was like, is the algorithm an archon? Is this like weird Gnosticism? And the way to sort of break out is to go outside and have this like weird existential crisis moment. I made jokes about it uh, to process the fact that I was having a minor existential crisis about if mm-hmm. Gnosticism is true, but only for Twitter. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Have you have you read much Philip K. Dick? Not much, No. He was obsessed with this idea of um, we actually live in some kind of Gnostic time warp hypostasis um, that we were actually supposed to be living in a much worse dystopia. um, But somehow, you know, Dallas, this kind of like semi-technology, he called it vast active living intelligence system. It was this sort of possibly semi-technological holy spirit force for good that would rewrite reality and time um to try to keep us on the, you know the best possible of all worlds even if it was still an imperfect world this sort of thing so especially he had an experience where he believed that Dallas had beamed pure like information into his brain um and he wrote this book called the exegesis where it's like 2000 pages long or something i I haven't read the whole thing but um you can find it online but he he goes into obsessively you know going into this idea of we actually live in a semi-simulated reality i think we ultimately concluded and i've talked about it on my podcast before um that we live in a mostly real reality surrounded by semi-real realities and you know at, at, at any given moment our mostly real reality it can be intersected by these um not fully developed realities and uh it's very even though he's like talking about this stuff in like the 60s and 70s you know it, it, it'll sound familiar to anybody who was into you know the matrix or simulation theory or that sort of stuff but he was talking about it way before you know computers and and, and the internet and the digital age or whatever were, were mainstream that's crazy because i pretty much agree with that conclusion i do not agree with the the simulation theory or the sort of ideas that we're living in the matrix um, i'm not a huge conspiracy person personally but I do think that we are living in a world that is mostly real, right? The outside, our personal lives, our careers, if you're a student, stuff like that. But then it's always being cut by this digital life because everyone has to use technology. I mean, it's at varying levels, but pretty much everyone you know has a phone. Most people a smartphone, mm-hmm. unless they're like a drug dealer or something and they have one of those little burner phones. You know, it's 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 weird because we're being cut by the social media and you see like when you meet people in the real world sometimes you can kind of tell someone's influenced by the internet like i've met certain people where i'm like yeah you are probably terminally online just by the type of stuff they talk about like i met this one girl and it was it was weird i was at this this fashion event in the city because i'm really into like weird fashion and like you know the like vintage stuff so i was at this kind of vintagey meetup and there was this girl there who I spoke with her and she like knew way too much about weird stuff. And so I was like, I was like, who are you? And I, I like, went on, I was, I was like, oh, there's something going on. What's your handle? Yeah. And I Good remember I went, on, yeah. Yeah, I went on her Instagram and she was like posting about like these really friend stuff. She had this like meme. There, there were just memes on her page where I was like, okay, this is the type of accounts that I follow. And it was just very bizarre seeing someone like that in the real world when I wasn't at, say, a Thelema event or something, right? And so you, it's like strange because you can almost tell who has been influenced more by the internet like in the real world. And so it's, it's very bizarre because the internet has started directly impacting like real world people. Like I've been influenced by the internet. I mean, a lot of what I've learned about from the occult is from the internet, you know? And so it's, it's, it's strange. It's very strange. It's, yeah. Hmm. Um, uh, let's see, hyper reality. I think Twitch is a great example where <laughs> people don't even play video games anymore. They just watch other people playing video games. So you have like, especially so it's like you have a video game, which is a simulated reality, a simulation of reality. 
then you have somebody who plays that video game and then you have somebody who just only watches that and only knows about that thing so i'm saying you stretch twitch out over like 20 30 40 years where people are just watching simulations of simulations um that would also be a very plausible form of hyper reality in my opinion what is hyper real have you seen those so i recently saw and it was recommended to me on youtube i saw a youtube upload of a Twitch segment of someone reacting to someone's Twitch debate, and in the background <laughs> of the Twitch debate, someone was playing a video game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was like, this is the YouTube equivalent of those like deep fried memes that had been like screenshot so many times yeah. that they're impossible now, to read. But now that's like for a lot of people, that is their primary source of information. And it's a completely scrambled <laughs> five six times removed piece of information it's it's all it's all very weird so my sort of final thing that i wanted to talk about was how do we escape hyper reality or will it inevitably consume us should we just prepare for the techno singularity <laughs> I what will is want... the do some divination for us right now it, it, oh. Are we becoming the techno dystopia and what can we do? Will the Twitch streams overtake us? One thing, I, well, for one, I would say maybe make peace with the fact that it's already all happened. Um, that mass media was kind of the singularity and now we're just decades into it. Uh, the idea that the singularity has to be like a wire going directly into your brain I think there's a little bit of cope there. So you might remember a couple years ago, um, Google Glass was was uh, experimented with in the Bay Area. Um, Google Glass, if you don't remember, it was you'd wear a p you'd wear glasses that uh, would basically have your iPhone in your eyes at all times. Um, you know, like a uh, augmented reality type of thing. And people hated it because it also had a little camera on it. So, you know, everyone you were talking to, you, you were, you were potentially recording and people got really, really offended by this. And there was actually the first, uh, they called them the first cyber hate crimes. They, you know, some people with Google glasses got beat up. They got their Google glasses torn off. And the thing is, is that on one hand, I totally understand. It would be so obnoxious to have somebody basically wearing an iPhone on their face. Um, all the time and, and recording you potentially while you, while you're just having a normal conversation with. But I also felt like we already carry phones around in our pockets. We're already recorded all the time. We're already, um, it, it, it's already happened. You're already being surveilled 24 seven. And so I felt like the anger at the person with the Google glasses was just kind of a cope. It was just because it was like a, a, a reminder of what had already happened to you. That's what was making you angry. And I think a lot of technological hyper reality, whatever you want to call it, discourse today, it's very similar. Like you, you're already part of the algorithm. You, you, you're you already um, living in a hyper real parasocial um, internet community. <laughs> you're already, you've already got terminal meme brain. It's already happened. And then you see some new manifestation of it or some more obvious or obnoxious manifestation of it. And then you're like, well, this is where I draw the line. But is it really, <laughs> is it really where you draw the line or is the line long gone? So, um, sorry to answer your question with a black pill, but in terms of escaping, Okay, I don't want to be a total downer. Right now, I am looking at Urbit, which is pretty interesting. Um, I'm not 100% Urbit pilled yet, but it is interesting. Urbit is like a um, decentralized version of the internet um, that's in its, in its early nascent stages. And maybe it has some promise. Maybe you could have like a post-social media internet um, where we can share information in a more humane, less algorithmically driven way. And that's cool to think about. Um, other than that, maybe people are just going to have to practice a little bit more self-control and unplug a little bit more. Um, I've been trying to do that. I've been trying to like just less screen time, more read time, more outside time. Um, I remember I used to get so excited to go home and go on the internet. Um, and then, then I got a smartphone and now I will turn my phone off and go outside to escape the internet. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a funny shift where it's like 
there, there was a time where the internet was like a special thing that I only did sometimes. You only had so many hours a day you could do it. And now that I have it 24 seven, like escaping from it is, is a reward. And the crazy thing to me is when I'll do that, when I'll turn my phone off, even for like three, four hours and go on a long walk or something like that. I noticed that if somebody did call me or someone did message me in that time period, they're often a little niffed, a little, you can tell, they're a little annoyed that I didn't get back to them fast enough, even when it's not something that was urgent. And I'm kind of like, I can't blame them because I know I'd feel the exact same way if I messaged my friend or something and he didn't respond. If he took like three hours to respond, I'd probably be mad about it. But it's it's not healthy. It's not healthy, but unfortunately, our whole world is, is structured around it now. So I hope I gave you a halfway decent answer. No, that's that's about how I've been feeling. Because what made me sort of want to discuss this and sort of go down this rabbit hole is that I've been spending a little less time online. I've been posting my touching grass photos, which is my my proof. It, it's me holding myself, as, as the internet likes to say, accountable, which is a word that makes me want to rip my teeth out. But I think that, that you're right. And I mean, I guess there is no true escape, even if you decide to. As I, I joke sometimes that sometimes when Twitter annoys me stuff, I'm going to... Uh, one day throw my phone out the window or into a river or something. But even then, I mean, you guess you can't really even fully escape it because I was at a picnic with my friends this past weekend and I dress very weirdly. For those who have not seen photos of me, I dress like I'm like living in the 1800s because it makes me happy. But I was in the park and this like random stranger woman decided to like take a picture of me. And so I got kind of pissed. So I was like, hey, if you're gonna take a picture of me, please ask questions. They weren't like a follower. They were literally just like a normie who's like, oh, you're dressed weird. I'm gonna take a photo of you. And I remember I got very irritated. Like, and I was oh, like, a Mennonite. Yeah, I think they thought I was like a cult <laughs> member or something. I don't know. And I was like, you can at least ask. And then, I don't know, I kind of argued with this like random middle-aged tourist woman in the park. And I was like, and I was like, there's no escaping the phones. We are doomed. And then I was like, <laughs> Take a fucking Xanax. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Because there's nothing I guess we can truly do about it. This is the most black filled ending of a podcast episode ever. Uh, I guess, I don't know, touch grass. Hyper reality is here. Be aware of it. I think being aware of hyper reality can make it a little bit less toxic. I don't know. Be self aware. And in the end, like, what happens offline matters more than what happens online. And maybe don't hate crime people with Google glasses on. That is our halfway optimistic podcast. Uh, where can people find you? Um, you can find me pretty much anywhere uh, you find podcasts, Schizotopia. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Brain Origami. On Instagram, I'm Schizotopia.pod. If you like weird stuff or anything I talked about in this podcast, I'm sure you will like um, my show. Um, and beyond that, I just want to say, if you think this podcast should be renamed Witch Sauce, <laughs> definitely tweet that at Georgina. Yes, he really wanted me to name this podcast Witch Sauce. So uh, harass me on Twitter until I change the name of the podcast if you disagree with the name and think it should be Witch Sauce. I'm Georgina. You can find me many, many places. I am on, I don't know, I'm on like, every platform i don't know i'm on instagram youtube twitter tiktok i made a sub stack but i haven't actually posted to it i am on twitch i haven't been on twitch in like three months but allegedly i'm coming back at some point i'm also on telegram and i think that's everywhere oh patreon yes if you join the patreon for the podcast you get uh, extra episodes extended episodes I think, uh, pre-shows, video versions. You get a lot of things if you if you do that. And thank you for listening and have a lovely day, night, mid-afternoon, mid-morning, dusk, whatever time it is, wherever in the world you are. And thanks for listening. Thank you.